Philippine Pharmaceuticals in association with Higher Secondary Principals Forum. Hello students, welcome once again to Prudent Scholars, one of the best initiatives in the field of education in Goa by Prudent Media and our own Principals Forum. Uh, I welcome you today to my today's class on a simple and a very easy topic from 12th standard biology syllabus point of view, but a very important topic from uh, which has relative importance to our uh, mother earth that is my topic today is biodiversity and its conservation and I am uh, your teacher for today with this lesson I am Shubhada Acharya Shirodkar with my lesson. So for, first of all I would uh, like you all to watch the video that I have made a uh, just two minute video before I start with my class. seen the different types of organisms that we saw on the screen there are birds there are animals there are plants there are trees there are so many different types of organisms so here I would like to use one same line from the textbook uh, that is there that if some alien descends on this earth the first thing that will amaze and baffle that person or that alien that which is the actual real organism here there will there is so much of life on this earth there are so many different types of organisms that are there that it is a very very amazing thing to see now the first thing that i would like to tell you all from this the chapter that is starting biodiversity and its uh, conservation life originated about 3.8 billion years ago and it has been continuing till date. We can see life in a very small ant 
and also in a very magnificent tiger as well as we can see life in a small encrustation like moss rixia what we see on the walls and also in a huge trees like oak trees or banyan trees people trees these are huge tree sequoia trees where life is existing now the term that is actually for your studies now that is biodiversity biological diversity and that is the short form biological diversity term was taken first by w g rosen in way back in 1985 then he had uh, coined it but later on it was popularized as biodiversity by uh, who is also called as father of biodiversity that is edward wilson okay that was in 1988 when he published uh, some articles and he represented them at a at a convention now the definition of biodiversity is very simple okay it is just the number and types of organisms present on this earth it's just the number and the types of organisms that are present on this earth and it also refers to the some total of diversity that exists at all levels of biological organization okay all levels of biological organization means which are the different levels there are three levels at which we study biodiversity and they are the three levels of biodiversity of that the first one is genetic diversity now here genetic diversity means the genes we know that all our characteristics all our traits all our characters that we portray from outside they are all controlled by genes and these genes are many in number in a particular species the second one is species biodiversity that is different types of organisms and the third one is ecological biodiversity that is different types of ecosystems now we'll see the genetic diversity first now that one example that is uh, uh, highlighted in your textbook is of genetic variability in case of rice now rice is one individual species but the genes the strains that are there of different types of rice are 50000 50000 varieties of rice are available now we can see the picture of the different types of rice which is available as well as the genetic variation in case of raulfia vomitoria that is found in the himalayan regions that the genes in this plant vary and because of this variation there is the potency of reserpine that is the drug that is available from this uh, plant which is taken and also we see genetic variability in the most uh, uh, delicious fruit what we call the king of fruits that is the mangoes there are so many different varieties of mangoes available and this is all because of the genetic diversity now this genetic diversity helps the organisms to adapt to the different types of environments in which they are placed the second one that is there is species diversity now species diversity these pictures that you see they are all taken here itself in our goa so the pictures that are there they show different types of birds a few type of plants the flowers the variety of flowers that are available they are the species now species are species diversity is the different types of organisms which are present in that particular environment now this in this case the species and uh, what happens is in this species diversity one more example that i can give you is in the western ghats in the western ghats we see immense species diversity in case of the amphibian species that is the types of frogs that we see from a single genus there are a variety of uh, examples that are available that is the species diversity the level of uh, 
difference that is there in species diversity. And the last level of biodiversity is the ecological diversity. Now, this is simple you can see that in India itself we have different types of ecosystems. One is we, we see deserts, we see uh, uh, this aquatic uh, oceanic uh, environments, then we see forest land, we see grasslands, we see different types of environments and these because of these different types of environments we see different types of organisms which live in this. So, biodiversity is also because of the difference in the, uh, the land pattern or the water patterns that are there and because to adapt to this different types of uh, places, different types of organisms are seen. The next uh, topic that is there in your uh, this is about the different the gases that are there, a wild gas is that about the number of species which are actually there. If you just go out and start counting the number of organisms that you come across, okay, there will be several different types of ants, there will be different types of insects, there will be different types of uh, birds, plants, the variety of organisms. If you just go out of your house, now, each and every one, the name and the record of that particular organism, whether it is made or not made, we are not sure. Whether it is recorded or not, we are not sure. So, we can see that eukaryotic species. Now, here I am talking about eukaryotic species, the report which came in 2011, it is estimated to be 8.7 million species are there plus or minus 1.3 million that is the report. According to your textbook uh, this which is published that shows that about 1.5 million species are already recorded, 1.5 million. But according to the estimates by different scientists because the forest like Amazon and all there are about uh, lakhs of uh, species which are not recorded, there are millions of insects which are not recorded. So, according to that they have made estimates. Now, this one of the estimates which is made is by Robert May that he says that there may be about 7 million species on this earth and what is sad that about 80 percent of the species are not yet recorded. So, we and mind you this millions what I am talking about this is only about eukaryotic species. We are not we have not considered here prokaryotes. So, there are different millions of bacteria and all which will be surviving on this earth. Now, India talking about uh, India, India is one of the 12 mega diversity countries in the world. Although we have a very small area in case of the land, land area is only small that is 2.4 percent of the total land mass of the world. But the diversity that we have according to the global this 8.1 percent is belonging to India. So, that is the global species diversity that we are contributing to. Now, this because of this uh, major part of ours in contributing to the biodiversity, we are having uh, hot spots. Now, in case of India, we have the hot spots of Himalayas, wherein there is lot of indigenous species. Then we have the Western Ghats, the Indo-Burma and the Sunda lands, our even our Andaman Nicobar islands which are there they contribute to the biodiversity and island specific species which are called as endemic species. Endemic species are species which are present only in that area and not anywhere else. This is our biodiversity hotspot map which we can see which shows the, dif the four different uh, areas that are there, the Himalayas the Indo-Burma region, 
the western ghats and the sunda land then according to the species now what we said about we are talking about millions of species not one or two or hundreds or thousands now if a pie chart is made only of the invertebrates invertebrates as you know they are the species which do not have a backbone okay uh, if we consider them the insects they form more than 3/4 of the about 70% of the animals that are recorded are insects that means out of every 10 animals if you record 7 will be insects and the remaining that is molas molas you know they are like bivalves you know and the gastropods they are all molas then crustaceans those which have a carapace then other animals like mammals and all they are considered still smaller groups in case of vertebrates okay in case of vertebrates we have which with the backbone now with the backbone there are the fishes which make the maximum number of species along with the mammals the birds reptiles and the amphibians the second major group is the birds you can see that there are thousands of species of birds existing in the world then we have the plants okay in case we combine plants and the fungus together then fungus and the flowering plants that we call as angiosperms they form the majority of the existing flora of the biodiversity then followed by algae mosses ferns and the other like lichens now when we have this so much of biodiversity how is it distributed on this earth how is it distributed whether all the areas throughout the earth whatever land whatever marine uh, waters we have are all the organisms distributed equally on all this areas or whether there are some patterns of division now in case of this the first one that is there is called as latitudinal gradients now here you have to remember what is a latitude now latitude only here i would like to use the chalkboard that is for showing you just to revise your a little little bit geography that is there if you all do not remember if i draw the earth okay now this is the equator okay this is the equator and this is the tropic of cancer and this is the tropic of capricorn now here is the arctic circle and here is the antarctic circle okay antarctic circle arctic circle the tropic of cancer and tropic of capricorn now only what i have to highlight here is the area from here to here it is called as the tropics and this area is called as the temperate area is called as the temperate area this and this and this is the polar region on both the sides okay now is for uh, the latitudinal gradients what we call okay we can see that the tropical area which is there the tropics have the maximum number of species even generally you must be realizing that tropical country and whenever you have thought about the polar regions there are very less number of species as you move from the as you move from the equator towards the two poles the number of species keeps on decreasing and it is maximum in the tropical area 
So why is this happening? What must be the reason for the tropical region to have more number of species than the polar regions and the temperate regions? There are three hypotheses which have been put forth. There are three hypotheses which have been put forth. One of them, the first one is that the tropics are relatively undisturbed. Now what does this mean by relatively undisturbed? That is means the temperate regions and the polar regions have been subjected to periods of glaciation. You must have heard about ice age. Okay? So ice age means the whole area gets covered with ice and it remains for a long time. Now earlier also there were ice ages. Okay? So when it intermittent in between there are periods and this now what we are having is an intermittent period. Now these areas, the temperate areas and the polar region, they were subjected to this glaciation periods and the species could not, uh, they could not stay there, they could not adjust there for that period of time and they had to become adjusted. By the time they become adjusted, the new glaciation period comes up. So that is why the tropics are not disturbed by this glaciation period. Maybe because of this we have in the tropical area more number of species than the other areas. Then the second reason that is given is tropics are less seasonal. Means even when uh, you must have observed that when we have winter here, what about the winter here and what about winter in, uh, in European countries or uh, in the polar region? There winter is full of snow whereas here in case of us who are staying in these areas, tropical areas, the winters are not very cold, we can adapt to that. Whereas even the other seasons, the seasons which are there, there is not much variation in these seasonal days. Whereas there, the seasons which are there, they are contrasting to each other, the environment contrasts. If there is autumn, totally there are no leaves on the plants. It does not happen in case of tropical areas. Okay? That is why it is called tropics are less seasonal. Okay? The, that is why it is said that tropics are less seasonal. That is why maybe the species can adapt more because there is not much variation in the seasonal changes. Then the third one is that tropical area gets more sunlight directly. This is known that in near the equator and in the tropical region there is more sunlight. So maybe more productivity because plants will produce more, more sunlight, so more production. So maybe more species survive because there is more food. So that is the third hypothesis that is there. Then the second uh, this is about the species area relationship in case of patterns of bio, how they are distributed. What is said in this is when you consider a single region, the spe if, you, if you count the number of species, then as you move, keep on counting, it, they will keep on increasing. The species richness will keep on increasing, but up to a certain limit that is within that particular environment. The number of species will not keep on increasing. It will stop at a particular place. Now that is species area relationship. Now the relation between the species richness and area for many birds and flowering plants, it, like, it is like initially it is slow, then it increases and then it remains. It is called as a rectangular hyperbola. Now the same thing mathematically if it is plotted on a logarithmic scale, it shows a straight line. Okay? It shows a straight line. That is species area relationship. 
Now what is the why? Now we have seen that there are so many species, we have seen that how they are distributed on this earth and now we have to see why, what is the importance of all these species to us. Now communities with more number of species generally tend to be stable. They are stable communities and so what happens? The productivity is more. When there are more number of plants, more number of green plants, the production will be definitely more. As well as when they are, they are resistant to natural or man-made disturbances. Now natural disturbances may be anything like extra heavy rainfall or it may be droughts, it may be floods, these are all natural uh, disturbances and also man-made disturbances like pollution and all that if there are more number of species then there is a this that most of them will survive although some of them may disappear. Then one more this is that they are resistant to alien species, invasion of alien species that is why more number of species in this environment are required. Then does it really matter to us if a few of these species what we saw so many insects, so many birds, so many why do we require them? Are they really important for us? They are important for our ecosystem health and balance okay and as well as ultimately what is important for us is it is important for us to survive on this earth they are important for survival of our human race. Now this is uh, whether I just asked one question does it really matter to us if a few species become extinct? Extinct means they just disappear from this earth. Now that is explained very nicely to us by Paul Eldridge. Now what he says is he has put forth a rivet popper hypothesis. Now here in this picture you can see that these are parts of a airplane. Now all these parts of the airplane they are fixed together by small uh, structures which they call as rivets. Okay. Now Paul what he did is he put it as an analogy that these rivets are the species and the aircraft is this earth. Okay, now what he said is if every time a passenger sits in the plane and wants to take one rivet as a souvenir, every, every passenger wants to take a souvenir, every time one is taken nothing will matter because you can see that there are so many which are there. So one taken, two taken, three taken it does not matter but when there are many which will start disappearing what will happen to the plane? So that is what he had put and also what is important is the place from where this rivet is taken. If it is taken from the wings it is dangerous but if it is taken from a window pane or the from the seat where you are sitting then it will not matter much but it also depends which species disappears. Okay, so that is the that is how this importance of our biodiversity means the number of species which we require is made by Paul Eldridge. To continue with the same thing that is extinction. Now since the origin of life what we have uh, faced is five episodes of extinction. Now five episodes of extinctions which have taken place earlier. Now we are in the sixth episode of extinction. Now sixth means now slowly our organisms, our species they are disappearing. Earlier what had happened that was natural. Even in the Cretaceous period we have seen that the dinosaurs they completely were washed off. So that is one of the extinctions. Now here what is going on now is called as the sixth episode of extinction and the only difference between the earlier five, the earlier were Cambrian 
explosion the second was carboniferous third was permian and the cretaceous was the one which the dinosaurs disappeared and now what is happening the difference is that it is 100 to 1000 times faster than the earlier ones so within another few thousand years it is said that all the species may start disappearing now these are a few examples of what are mentioned in your textbook i am restricting myself because biodiversity is such a chapter that we can give n number of examples and uh, different things but uh, i have to restrict myself to the only the topics which are mentioned in the chapter so these are examples which are mentioned in your uh, textbook that is the dodo bird the kaga the stella sea cow the stella sea cow was a very huge uh, animal which was just lying on the islands it was it is like a cow it's a very slow moving organism and it was hunted so much hunted for food that the last one also was hunted and eaten and there are no more sea cows then the thylacine from australia and the, this is about this tigers the caspian bali tiger the jawan they are no more to be seen on this earth as well as there is one more that asiatic cheetah the fastest mammal in on this earth is extinct from india at least it is not there it is found only in one place i think in iran okay so that is the this of animals and birds which are becoming extinct our children will not be able to see this majestic animal which we used to call as the uh, the cheetah which was there earlier now loss of biodiversity what will happen if the species are lost first thing is plant production will come down the second thing is they will not be resistant when many are together they are resistant when they become less in number they become less resistant and the third one is they will the whole pattern of our rain now we say rains heavy rains either heavy rains or less rains then the whole pattern of this will change our cycles will start changing so that is what will happen if biodiversity loss is there in any region then now what are the causes of loss of biodiversity now this causes are broadly placed in four major reasons or four major causes and it is together called as the evil quartet now evil quartet first one is definitely habitat loss and fragmentation and which is the most important one from the word itself we can make out habitat loss means destroying their houses means the organisms houses and fragmentation means making pieces of their houses wherein the forests are cut every time we are having some project like uh, building a dam or we are we want to put up a agricultural place or we want to develop a land for some industry what is done first thing what is done is the forests are cut so what will happen to the animals and plants which were there they will be devoid of their houses second reason is fragmentation organisms which move over a large area like elephants tigers they require large areas to move there are water holes and all if we make a small part of the forest is cut then if the water holes are there in those places then the organisms will suffer the species which depend on this water will suffer and pollution also is another reason for this habitat loss okay so as well as in some places like uh, the amazon itself for growing soybeans there are wild areas which are cut down forests are cut down and animals which are staying there they either move from this place and if they can survive in that other place they will survive or they will be dying out like this if patches are cut out 
and animals they lose their habitats then the second reason is over exploitation now what is over exploitation is it is said that uh, human beings or nature provides for everybody if we do not disturb any environment we get everything for our need what do we re require as food we just required a meal twice a day proper balanced meal twice a day but nature cannot provide us for our greed even if i need two times of food our houses will be stocked with the food that is required for a month but even in nature the same thing happens when we take what is more than what is required especially this is happening in case of marine fishes many many marine fishes which are there they are becoming extinct because of over exploitation what happens is when we dredge or when we use the net there are different types of fishes which are coming only those fishes are taken out which are required as food but what about the other they are just left even which are not required they are just left into the on the sea bed or on the sea shore to die when we harvest fish okay what is done is only the good ones what we need are taken and the remaining they are just thrown out in the this so because of this also there are many species which are lost of marine species so human beings should take care that we take only for our need and not become very greedy so and the next this is alien species invasion now in case of alien species invasion alien species are other species which do not grow in that particular area they are not native species so when deliberately some species are introduced so what happens is they because especially when they are animals because they do not have a natural predator like for example nile perch it was introduced in the lake victoria because there were too many fishes of those cichlid variety now what happened is it ate away that variety as well as it ate away the others also because this nile perch did not have anybody to eat it it did not have a natural predator so that is why exotic species when they are introduced in environments they create havoc to that particular environment also you can see that chromolena uh, it is also called as congress gavot in case of our uh, local languages it is growing so much in all our caju plantations our road sides even our it has started invading our uh, individual home gardens because the flowers of this they cannot be destroyed very easily it is just growing as a wild weed and it is supposed to have come from some packaging from some other country so that is also a exotic species and it can survive any very sturdy it is and it can survive any condition without even water for a long time even these are some of the exotic uh, species or the alien species which are invading like for example water hyacinth water hyacinth ecornia was introduced in the waters to reduce pollution but what it did was it grew so fast in the waters that it started clogging the waterways the pipelines and all which take water it started growing in that also so that is the water hyacinth then the last one is co extinctions the reason for biodiversity loss first was habitat loss and fragmentation second one is uh, alien species invasion third is uh, over exploitation and fourth one is co extinction co means together and extinct means become extinct together when some species are bound together by obligation some organism stay together like for example there are some fishes 
with whom some parasites they stay they stay on those fishes only now if the fish become extinct the parasite also becomes extinct like some isopods which are uh, obligate which have obligatory relationship with a snapper fish so these two both of them together if one dies the other one also will die out one example is here is this example which is given in your textbook that is the yucca flower yucca plant and the pronuba moth for pollination this yucca plant requires only that moth if the moth is not there then the flower also will not survive or the, if the flower is dying out the plant dies out then even the moth will die out because it can survive only on that that is called as coextinction then now we have seen that there are so many species we have also seen that they are becoming extinct we have also seen the causes of biodiversity loss now we have to see whether what we can do why do we have to conserve this biodiversity the first one is narrowly utilitarian approach now what is this narrow mindedness in short we can call it narrow mindedness selfishness because i want food because i want my medicines because i want my drugs the medicines which come from the plants and animals because of that i have to preserve them second is broadly utilitarian approach because the biodiversity gives so many ecosystem services that is the oxygen is replenished on this earth because of organisms then we can see that uh, different uh, processes like cycling nutrient cycling that is because of uh, this biodiversity then the third one is also pollination services are given by the organisms different types of organisms so that is a broadly utilitarian approach because everybody is benefited then the third one is ethical approach now this or ethical means according to our values that we have the morals that we have this earth belongs to all of us we are just one species human beings are just one species which belongs which has a right to stay on this earth like other animals other plants and even the microbes which are staying in the soil they have equal right for staying on this earth so who are we to disturb their houses who are we to destroy where they are supposed to stay they can equally stay on this so that is a ethical approach because we have to live together that is these are the three approaches for why we should conserve biodiversity then now that we know that biodiversity loss is there that we should conserve biodiversity also then how do we conserve biodiversity how can we go about protecting our nature protecting our wildlife protecting the other species other than human beings the first approach is in situ in situ means in the situation where they are wherever they are you make them stay safely this approach and the second approach is ex situ approach now ex situ conservation means exhume them remove them from the place where they are take them to a protected area and protect them keep them in a place where they can be safe because they are not safe in their natural habitat remove them from there and place them somewhere else that is called as ex situ the first type of conservation that is the in situ the first one that is there is biodiversity hotspots i told you the earlier in the earlier topic we saw what is a hotspot hotspot is a protect totally protected area where there are maximum number of endemic species endemism means that particular species is present only in that area and nowhere in the world that is called as endemism the second one is biosphere reserves okay now biodiversity hotspots we have seen earlier there are four hotspots okay in case of uh, biosphere reserves 
they are big protected uh, areas which are there we have about 14 in uh, india where along with the tribes and all whichever uh, human beings they are staying there the whole area gets protected then the second one is national parks national parks we have about 90 national parks in india i am talking about in india and in this national parks other than wild animals and plants nothing else is allowed no agriculture no nothing else is allowed in this area so that the all the animals and plants which are there they get protected then this is one of our this only netra wildlife sanctuaries wildlife sanctuaries are places where animals wild animals can move around freely and these are protected along with the human settlements which are there inside the areas and they can do their work of agriculture and all but that land gets protected and no hunting and all is allowed in that area then these are there is one more very good concept in all over india which is called as sacred groves now sacred groves is places where which have religious importance okay religious importance what happens is if uh, we are god fearing people now if somebody says that land belongs to a particular deity or a particular god then and no plants or animals are supposed to be touched from that area then nobody will go there so like this in our especially in our northeastern uh, areas like meghalaya and all there are many sacred groves which have been able to sustain lots of uh, wild plants and animals which are present only there they are protected because of this sacred groves even in our goa we have our nirankara chirai then uh, siddha chirai this side kepe we have parka chowal there are so many places which are called as sacred and they are all protected and that is a type of in situ conservation then we have the ex situ type of conservation ex situ type means i told you all we remove the organisms or we remove the animals or plants from that place and take it to a safe place and we we have zoological parks botanical gardens wildlife safari parks cryo preservation and in vitro fertilization tissue culture and seed banks in case of zoological parks in other short form it is called as zoo you must have all visited a zoo once or at least once in your uh, life so where animals are protected in different cages or a big areas are allotted to them but they are restricted their movement is restricted and they are kept in different places where you can move around that is called as a zoo then botanical gardens the largest botanical garden that is there in calcutta that is botanical survey of uh, india there the huge uh, banyan tree also is there with uh, hundreds of plants which were threatened in the wild they are brought there and planted they are called as botanical gardens where plants are brought from somewhere else and they are made to survive in artificial conditions then we have the national parks where tourists also can go but the wildlife is undisturbed then cryo preservation technique is a technique of uh, preserving samples of seeds of uh, spermatozoa and uh, tissues cells cryo preservation is at minus 196 degree c that is liquid nitrogen it can be preserved for a long time and whenever required they can be taken back that is called as cryo preservation techniques which are used in preserving uh, gametes preserving uh, spermatozoa preserving seeds preserving tissues and all also the in vitro fertilization in vitro fertilization means the sperm and the gametes female gamete are made to fertilize in the laboratory condition and then they are implanted in healthy animals then also tissue culture is a technique by which the 
plants endangered plants can be made to multiply and they can be grown back in safe areas also there are seed banks seeds of endangered species threatened species they are taken and kept in seed banks where they can be taken and grown whenever required now because of all this what we have seen because of all this what we have seen there are many areas where people have started taking initiatives in protection now this the major step towards protection of biodiversity started in 1992 with the uh, earth summit of radio genero and they uh, 150 countries participated in this and also again it met in 2002 to have the session for uh, making bylaws or making rules for the whole world to follow so that indiscriminate loss or indiscriminate killing or uh, habitat loss of organisms is not there there are some rules which are universally followed so that people can conserve biodiversity so and also for that 22nd of may as you know is allotted as the world biodiversity day by our united nations then again the efforts that are there they are continuing for uh, biodiversity conservation and we are still following the as per but what is very fresh is 2019 reports are there about 25% of our species are very fast going away from this earth so 2011 to 2020 is being made as the un decade for biodiversity and now the further one 2020 to 30 is made as a ecosystem restoration decade so we have to see that as much as possible we can make this place safe and conserve our biodiversity for our future and for our this so with this your uh, topic for uh, this biodiversity is ending and with all this knowledge now this type of chapters are introduced in your syllabus because with all this knowledge you also have to be sensitized as students and you have to be aware about what actually is happening in this earth and with this topics what i have discussed today i hope you have realized the importance of biodiversity and what is happening around us and also as a chapter for your 12th standard biology uh, goa board exams i hope i have you have learned from this chapter and all the best and good luck for your exams also for goa board thank you prudent scholars powered by lupin pharmaceuticals अब आपकी सुरक्षा आपके हाथों में ल्यूपी से हैंड सैनिटाइजर आपका और चेन्नई सुपर किंग्स का फर्स्ट लाइन ऑफ डिफेंस अब आपकी सुरक्षा आपके हाथों में ल्यूपी से हैंड सैनिटाइजर आपका और चेन्नई सुपर किंग्स का फर्स्ट लाइन ऑफ डिफेंस अब आपकी सुरक्षा आपके हाथों में ल्यूपी से हैंड सैनिटाइजर आपका और चेन्नई सुपर किंग्स का फर्स्ट लाइन ऑफ डिफेंस